Hi, I'm David Gristwood, I'm with Keith Burns here, and we're going to talk about velocity. So, straight off, Keith, what is velocity? Well, velocity is an in-memory data cache, and it can run across one or more than one machine as a consistent cache. And because it's memory rather than disk, it runs orders of magnitude faster than pulling data off a disk. Okay, so I've worked with SQL for quite a few years now, and uh, SQL has some pretty good caching. So what's different about velocity? So that's a great question, David. A SQL Server, along with many, many other relational databases, are great at caching data and memory. But those, those machines tend to be rather expensive. They tend to have great I.O. subsystems. They tend to have a lot of disks. And to scale them up is very expensive. There's often quite a lot of data that really doesn't need to be written to disk. And that can potentially be put in a data cache and moved off onto cheap blade systems that are far more cost effective. So I've produced a diagram that I'm going to use to try and show you some of the other points I want to make here. So as you can see David, we have a diagram here where we have velocity sitting in the middle with the clients at the top and the relational database at the bottom. Of course, in each of the clients, there's actually a bunch of DLLs, which are actually the velocity clients in here that talk and, and worry about the navigation to multiple servers. So these machines are all acting as one consistent um, cache. So if we, we consider some scenarios, if, let's say, for example, we had product catalog data. Now, the interesting thing about that is that typically it's read very, very frequently by clients, and very many clients, but it doesn't really get updated. And so we can cache that in the mid-tier with very high throughput, I.O. throughput, without actually having to affect the database at all. Another example, which is somewhat different, is perhaps session data. And the session data is very partitionable in that um, we can put that data across multiple machines and there's no need to actually reference the data for one user on this machine with the data for another user on that machine. But what's different about session data is although it's not a permanent record that we need to keep, it does need to be available for the whole life of the session. And that again is where one of the features of Velocity is very powerful and then we can set up the cache so that there's redundancy so that if for example we lose one of the machines here then all the data uh, that was cached on here for sessions there's a backup copy across the other machines and that takes over automatically so that the session data is preserved for the lifetime of that client session so in both cases by um, using velocity to serve this data, we preserve the bandwidth of the relational database to take the real crux of the system, which is the orders or the permanent data that we have to store in this database. And therefore, we don't end up with a monumental relational database that costs us a great deal of money um, by offloading the other stuff to Velocity. So the first thing we're going to do is install Velocity onto um, different servers. So at Microsoft.com, we're downloading yep. it. Run the install, and all it will ask us for is a couple of basic questions. Very, very simple install. A couple of options, which I'm going to leave as default, and then a main configuration screen. We need to put in, we can either store the data in um, a network share, or we can store it in SQL Server. We configure the cluster with um, path to the network share and we give it a cluster name and that cluster name will be picked up automatically in the next install. So that's the important bit. Yep. And then we set a cluster size and that just gives the system an idea of how to um, hash data across the multiple machines. So this is an algorithmic thing. Absolutely. And you can go and set these up later on again, but this is just the initial configuration. So that's the first machine installed, very, very simple. The second machine is almost the same. Yep. We just there, we, a minute ago, we just saw the actual configuration files. So they were the files sitting on the file server that all the machines will pick up the configuration details from and that's what the install set up. So, so the second one should be a lot easier then? Second one, almost identical, same questions. We put in the network path again, but this time it will pick up the cluster name because we defined it before. And again, it's just finished. So that was it. You repeat that maybe five, six so times. So that's it. We've configured two yeah. machines there. So now we're actually going to do the admin. So first, it's a PowerShell application, and we're going to start up the cluster. So we just 
the command is start cache cluster, that starts up all the machines in the cluster so they're up and running. And then there's various commands we can use to look at the details and the configuration. The key thing here is we're actually going to create a cache. So we can have multiple caches. We're going to create one that we're going to use in the code later on. And we're going to set it up so that it never evicts the data and that it's not fault on. So now we're just going to create the simplest application. Coding time. Yeah, it's going to be a console application in this example, but of course in the real world, probably the majority of applications would be mid-tier web-based applications. But we're deliberately trying to keep this code keep really simple, simple so you see exactly yeah. what's going on, and this is the bit of code that's consuming and interacting with, with the velocity. Velocity, whatever your application happens to be. So the first thing we need to do is pull a bunch of DLLs back. Now those DLLs were installed on the Velocity server and we need to pull those over and use them in the client. Those are the DLLs that are basically the Velocity client code. So in the dev environment, we need the DLLs because they have all the classes that exposes all the Velocity Correct. functionality we're actually going to be using Correct. in the sample here. And they do all sorts of cool things. They, they have the ability to cache on the client they have the, as well as, of course, on the Velocity servers themselves, they do the routing to various Velocity servers, etc. So there's actually some really clever intelligence in those DLLs. But we don't really need to worry about that. It all happens for us. So, Because the focus here is to make it very easy to get up and going and initialize the cache. And in fact, all we really need to do here is we're going to really have four lines of code that, that declare and initialize the cache in this client app. Uh, make, make the client app aware of where the, the um, Velocity server is. Um, once we've done that, we'll then be able to actually interact with the cache and put data into it. And I'm right in understanding that we could have multiple caches with different characteristics all being used within so this application. So the Velocity cluster, which is one or more machines, and quite possibly five, six, seven, eight machines, can have multiple caches across that client, those that cluster group, and those caches can have different behaviours. So even though we're only using one here? We're only using one, and um, but basically we could have had five, six caches. Some of them could have been highly available with um, a sort of RAID 5 type redundancy of data. Some of them could be just simply um, straightforward. In fact, the example we're using doesn't have any high availability no, we just, attributes. We've just set just it up here, cache and now we've just two machines. And now we've done the initialization. We're actually interacting so with the cache. This is the the cache we've now created was called products. So we've now initialized it, and we're now putting our first product into it so we put it in with a with a key which is a string in this case a one and we're putting in a it we're putting in a, a value of products because so this is a name value pair a type name value pair situation. we're putting in and then we can pull it back with a get command so we put it in with put command we get it back with a get command a using the pattern. key yeah fairly very very simple and then we're just going to to display that now obviously the, your imagination run out at this point having pushed up string into it, you pulled it back out and display it. That was pretty much it. But having said that, I mean, there's a lot more we could have done. We could have um, used other concepts such as regions, which we could enumerate over. We can use something called a tag to flag certain values that we can pull back as groups. And we'll probably deal with those in another session. But this is the moral equivalent of hello world Absolutely. for caching, isn't it? So here's the res that was the result. And just these the are the final stats. thing, we're getting the stats out. Again, going back to this PowerShell administration application, we can see the stats. And we see we, we had a certain size, 48 bytes we used in the cache. And we can see how much I.O. we did. And of course, that's invaluable um, when you're actually running in, in production.